Welcome back to the most boring videos ever made where we go through the R6RS report. We're currently on page six. Just to give you some context, we are going through uh, <clears throat> the overview of scheme, the description of the language. Um, last time we read page five, and so we were up to 1.1, the basic types. And we're still going through basic types. Remember, this is non-normative, this section. This is giving an overview of the language, but it's not actually defining the language as if you were going to be an implementer. <clears throat> okay, so we're just getting a high-level sense of how the language works before we dive into the full technical definition. And so last time we ended up looking at strings as... Um, was pointed out in one of the comments, uh, strings get very tricky with Unicode because the same string, at least in terms of appearance, uh, the way it looks on the screen actually could be different in terms of the Unicode characters and whether or not the strings are considered equal and all that. And that's been the basis for uh, different types of attacks on the web where someone looks at a string for a URL, uh, but it turns out actually it's a slightly different URL that points to a different website, that kind of thing. So Unicode is tricky and very subtle, and I don't know that much about it. Uh, we're going to move on because I try not to do strings, actually. I mean, sometimes I go do strings. Like Medicanron, we do strings, but... Symbols, that's what I'm about. I'm about symbols. Let's talk about symbols. A symbol is an object representing a string. Oh, great. The symbol's name. Unlike strings, two symbols whose names are spelled the same way are never distinguishable. Eh? Oh, oh, yeah, okay, I see. Yeah. I, I see. Uh-huh. Symbols are useful for many applications. For instance, they may be used the same way enumerated values are used in other languages. Okay. So, so first of all, uh, let's look at this claim that two strings that are spelled the same way may not be equal. So if I do equal foo and equal foo, okay, that's the same. Um. What happens if I make the string like really long? Is there any difference there? Oh, those are the same. Uh, oh, what could be different? How could those be different? I mean, there's the GenSim stuff, but they don't really look the same unless you turn off the GenSimming. Two symbols whose names are spelled the same way are never distinguishable. So there must be strings that are spelled the same way that are distinguishable. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to read more. Um, if you have big nums, oh, uh, maybe these aren't EQ. Yeah, okay, okay. So so there are different types of uh, notions of equality. Okay, there we go. So EQ, question mark, that's like pointer equality. Are these the same objects in memory? Okay, so that's probably the type of equality they're talking about. Whereas symbols, where we can have the quoted symbol. Yeah, okay, so those are the same, uh, same symbol. So this type of pointer equality is a very fast test. Uh, equal question mark um, is actually can can actually be very slow. Uh, it, it's a recursive definition. So if you have trees, for example, or recursively structured data, equal question mark may have to go through and recur completely. Um, or for these strings, you know, may have to compare the strings character by character to make sure they're identical. If they, if they aren't referring to literally the same location in memory. Now, if we do want these, um, you know, the, the, the same object to be pointer equal, uh, pointer equal, we can say let str be foo. 
Okay, so I'm gonna let bind give a name. And now I can say is str eq to str, and that's true because it's that's the same string in memory, the same object in memory. Okay. All right, that's, uh, of course, there, there are many notions of equal in scheme. There's another one called EQV. There's numeric equality. There's uh, string equal. No, oh, maybe not. Oh, uh, string equal. Is it this? Is it that? No. Is it that? Yeah, there we go. There's that thing. Wow, that's an awkward name. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, lots of notions of equality, but if you're thinking about EQ question mark, which is pointer equality, or, or are these the same objects in memory? Yeah, with, with symbols we get um, the EQness if they're spelled the same way. With strings, that's not the case. So e, um, EQ question mark uh, gives us a fast comparison of these uh, symbols, and symbols, you know, sort of represent atomic. Uh, entities, that's the way I think about it. They don't really have uh, components, but you can take a string, or sorry, sorry, you can take a symbol and convert it to a string and go back and forth between them. Um, and so I think we've seen this before. So if I go symbol string, okay, great. And I forget, is there one the other way? So we can go back and forth between them. All right, <clears throat> excellent. Uh, symbols are useful for many applications. For instance, they may be used the way enumerated values are used in other languages. So, you know, maybe I have three colors, right? And I can put this on the quote list, red, green, and blue, RGB. Okay, so those are three symbols, and I can get, you know, the second one of those, and that's a symbol. Okay, so, you know, maybe I want to do uh, comparisons to see if a color happens to be green or not. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice way to represent information. <clears throat> okay, enumerated values. Pairs and lists. A pair is a data structure with two components. The most common use of pairs is to represent singly list linked lists, where the first component, the car, represents the first element of the list, and the second component, the cutter, the rest of the list. Scheme also has a distinguished empty list, which is the last cutter in a chain of pairs that forms a list. <clears throat> okay, pairs and lists. So. There's an empty list right there. Uh, quote it. <clears throat> In older versions of Scheme and some lists, you have something called nil. Uh, nil's not special in R6. Okay, so we have the empty list. <clears throat> we can create a cons pair. So we can cons three on the four. We can cons cat dog. Okay, and so we get a pair. And so the part before the dot is the car and the part after the dot is the cutter. We can actually, we can also just quote quote a pair. I'll show that. Okay. And we can ask if, if that's a pair. It, uh, I gotta quote it. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> that's right. So now I can take uh, the car to get the first element. And I can do the cutter, get this, the part after the dot. And these names famously in Lisp, car and cutter, uh, are from old hardware. Um, contents of the address part of the register and the decrement part of the register on a old IBM machine. Um, you can read up on the history, but the reason um, 
lispers like those names, if you haven't come across this, is that you can chain them. So you can say catter, for example, to get the second element, uh, which is, that's the same as the car of the cutter. Okay. So um, at least in R5, it was every sequence of these four letters in the middle between the A and R, or sorry, the, the C and the R, um, every four letter sequence or, or one to four letter sequence of A's and D's between the A and the R um, was built in. So that would have been built in in R5 and I assume similar in R6. So, yep, so that's built in or I could do, uh, whoops. <clears throat> okay, that's built in. That's built in. Okay, so you could see it would be kind of annoying to have to write the car of the coder of the car of the coder, um, but I can just write that as one thing. Now, this is not very abstract. Okay, so the fact that, I, that I'm writing this, this is sort of assembly language-ish, so I might want to build abstractions, but the point is, you know, if I'm playing around with pair structures, this allows me to easily access uh, parts of the pairs. And of course the pairs can be nested. So, you know, cons produces pairs as the constructor. So I can cons the cons of uh, three, four, onto a cons of cat dog. <clears throat> okay, and so now I get this nested pair structure. Um, this is kind of interesting the way it's printed out. When you see this sort of structure, what that really is equivalent to is the dot in this set of prints like that. Okay. Notice that they print out the same. So uh, this gets into the notion of a list and what's a list, a proper list and an improper list. So as it says in, in that description, if uh, we have, uh, let's read the exact um, wording. Scheme also has a distinguished empty list, which is the last cutter in a chain of pairs that forms a list. Okay, so I guess another way to look at it is we can form a list, say three, four, five, okay? And I can take the cutter of that. So that's the rest of the list. So, you know, the car of that list gives me the first thing, the three. And if I want the rest of the list, I can get the cutter. Okay, and I can get the cutter of that. Okay, and I take, can take the cutter of that and that's the empty list, okay? And because of this chaining I was showing you, instead of writing cutter, 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 I can just write cutter, cutter, there we go. Okay, so that's, that's the empty list. And so another way to think about it is if we wanna build a list, I can cons three on the cons four, onto cons five, onto the empty list, and that gives me the list three, four, five. Okay, so um, the, the key part is that the last cutter, you know, the cutter of the last uh, pair that I'm constructing better be the empty list, or the list itself better be the empty list. So if we think about what, what a list is, in scheme I can ask question, list question mark, it's a type predicate. The empty list, is indeed a list. What about what I get when I cons three onto the empty list? Well, that is indeed a list. And just to make sure we know what that looks like, we get back list three, okay? I could also cons, whoops, uh, I could cons two onto that. Okay, so that's gonna be list two, three. And I could cons a one onto that. So these are all lists. Now what's not a list? Well, obviously things like the number three by itself is not a list. 
However, beyond that, if I do something like cons two onto three, that is also not a list. What I get is a pair, but this pair structure itself doesn't represent a list because that last cutter is not the empty list. So we can build up a notion of a list or what's sometimes called a proper list inductively. So a proper list is going to be either the empty list or it will be a pair, which we can produce with cons, for example, whose cutter is a proper list. So I can build up a proper list this way. So notice the cutter of that pair is a proper list inductively or recursively because the empty list is a proper list. Okay, so that's a proper list. Uh, or we can build up a list that's a pair. This overall structure is going to be a pair. When we evaluate the cons, we'll get back a pair whose cutter is what we get from evaluating this cons expression is a proper list. Okay, it's, a, it's like a recursive or inductive definition. It's an inductive definition of a list. Okay. So <clears throat> why do you sometimes see dots? So if we, if we do something like cons three on the four, we see a dot. So this is what's called a dotted pair. If I cons three onto cons four onto empty list, we don't see any dots in the result. But what that really is, is a dotted pair of this structure. Notice that they print out the same, okay? So we have an outer pair here from the outer cons, and we have an inner uh, pair, dotted pair from the inner cons. So you can see I have two calls to cons, and I have two dots when I fully expand the pair structure. So every time there's a call to cons, you're going to get a dotted pair. Um, and what comes before the dot will be the car, and what comes after the dot will be the cutter. Okay. Um, so if I wanted to get access to this part, the four, I would have to get, if I was starting on the outside, I'd have to take the cutter to get what's after the dot on the outer pair. Okay, and then within that inner pair, I would have to take the car. So that would be the car of the cutter, which is also known as the cutter. And cutter just means second. And that's what a, a, a schemer just thinks of that as the second element of a list is a cutter. It's another way to think of it if you have a proper list. Okay, so whenever you see these uh, dots printed out, that means that there, you don't have a proper list. So let's look at that again. So I could do 3.4, okay? Because if I cons three onto four, it's equivalent to consing three onto four, the value of that, okay? So we see a dot here because we don't have a proper list. So we don't have an empty list or a proper another type of proper list after the dot in the, in the cutter position. We can also, build up things that are almost proper lists. Okay, so if I put a, a the empty list here at the end, we get an honest to goodness proper list, right? No dots. But if I were to put a seven there instead of the empty list, now we get this structure, three, four, five, six, dot seven. Okay, so only if you have a proper list will the structure be printed without a dot. So in this case, uh, we can look at the list structures or the pair structure. So we have an outer, outer pair, three dot something. Remember, every time we have a cons, we've, we get a dotted pair. And then, okay, there we go. Same printing. And you can count up the dots and count up the cons, and you'll see they match the number of those and the positions. Okay, so whenever you see a dot printed out, it means you have an improper 
uh, structure. Okay, so it gets very annoying to see this many parens and this many dots. So most uh, scheme printers are going to suppress all the dots that and parens that they can. They can't suppress the outer uh, parens, and if you have an improper uh, list structure, they they're just going to have to have at least one dot in them. Okay, so that's that's what you're seeing in that case. Um, yeah. So, and of course, if I ask if this is a list, the answer is no. Great. Yeah. So, you know, in some sense. You know, you could argue, but lists are not really built into scheme in some sense, or, you know, really they're pair structures. And in another sense, you know, lists are really what lists, <laughs> what schemes about. I mean, scheme is a list, which stands for list processing. But the idea is that there is a lower level abstraction, which is the cons pair and the empty list. And the notion of a list, of a proper list, is inductively defined using. Uh, pairs and using the empty list. So and that's something important to understand. All right, vectors. Vectors. Vectors, like lists, are linear data structures representing finite sequences of arbitrary objects, whereas the elements of a list are accessed sequentially through the chain of pairs representing it. The elements of a vector are addressed by integer indices. Thus, vectors are more appropriate then lists for random access to elements. Okay, so, you know, if we want to get, you know, like say say we actually do have a proper list that we're building up like that. Okay, and we want to get our hands on, you know, say the six, right? So we have this data structure, this list. We want to get our hands on the, on the six, well, we're gonna be taking a lot of cutters. Uh, let's see, start cuttering down there. All right, I went, went a little too far. All right, then we wanna get our hands on the six part. Okay, there we go. Cadidur. We have to take the cadidur to get our hands on the six. So every time we're doing one of these, these cutters, uh, we're we're sort of chasing a pointer um, to the the second half of the pair, and every time we're taking a car, we're chasing a pointer of the first half. Unless you know there might be an optimization where the the value of six could be put in um, that position instead of a pointer. But in any case, you know we we have to every time we're doing one of these cutters, we have to follow um, follow the pair. Once again, maybe there's an optimization for this last cutter where instead of a full pointer, maybe there's a special representation of the empty list. But for these other uh, cutter operations, we're going to have to chase pointers probably. Okay. So uh, that's a lot of work. And you'll compare that to getting the first element of the list where we only have to do the car. And you know you can see it's more expensive. And if the list were a million elements long, well, I'm either going to have to write a lot of catters and, and or a lot of du -du 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 you know, C, A, and, you know, about a million Ds following it, which means really I'm going to have to write a recursive uh, program and it's going to be very slow. Or I could use a different um, data structure. Instead of using a singly linked list, I could use like uh, a vector, which normally would be called an array in most other languages. So I could do vector three, four, five, six, seven. Of course, I don't have to stick uh, just numbers. I could put a cat in there and I could put a hash f in there. Okay. And now I can, first of all, I can ask, is this thing a vector? Just like I asked if I had lists, like, yeah, that's a vector. And now I can access an element using vector ref who's the the argument order I always forget. Let's see, let's, uh, okay, there we go, I got it right. So these are zero indexed. So the, the first element of the vector is zero indexed. And I can get, you know, the fourth, okay, actually that's the fifth element, 
which is the hash f, or I could get the fourth element, which is cat. All right. I can also modify these. <clears throat> I can do a vector set bang of this and see if I can uh, get the arguments right. Okay. Now in this case, I don't have a handle to the vector, so let me give a name. Oops. Okay, so here's our original vector. And let's set V. Okay. And now if I look at V again, we can see that we've updated dog. And the, the key point, point here is it's random access. Um, so I can access the millionth element as quickly as I can uh, access the first element. So that's a, a vector, and there's also a make vector. So I can say I want a vector of 100 elements. They're all initialized to zero in this case. Maybe I want 100 cats. Okay, I could do that as well. Um, now, uh, one difference between a vector and list is the vector is going to be a fixed size. A cons pair, of course, is a fixed size. However, you can chain the cons pairs, so you can build them up like this and build lists or nested trees, uh, you know, build various structures and, you know, do, do so in a nice, nice compositional way and where recursion and inductive uh, algorithms are kind of standard. You can nest vectors, so you could have a vector containing a vector. Okay, so you can do things like this, and you know you can do recursions over those structures. But the fact that you can't grow the size of the structure in the same way you can with cons pairs, um, you know, it uh, generally, if you're writing a recursive algorithm in Scheme, at least in the beginning, before you've decided on some optimized implementation you know, probably you're going to more, more likely start with the, these uh, list and pair and tree structures. Um, but vectors are very useful. You can also use vectors to implement records and things like that. Now, R6RS has records, um, but if you want to implement something like structs, you know, you could use vector as kind of a, a lightweight struct mechanism. You could maybe put some syntax with some macros over it. Now, if you look at Racket or, you know, like Racket has structs built in. Okay, so, you know, there, there are implementations that have structs built in, but you can also, you know, do your own, um, kind of roll your own based on top of vectors, that can, kind of thing. So this is a random access data structure. Procedures. Procedures are values in scheme. How do you create a procedure? You can pre create a procedure with Lambda. There we go, we get back a procedure. Their values, what does that mean? It means you can stick a value in a list. Okay, there we go. We have four procedures. You can do things like uh, map over that list. So let us apply a function. We can ask procedure question mark, are all of the objects in this list, let me just format it a little easier so you can see. Are they all procedures? True, 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 true. Each one individually is a procedure. There's also uh, and map. And I think it's is it hyphenated. I don't remember. Okay, so and map will succeed if um, this predicate returns true for all value. So if I wanted to get a false value, I could say, well, let's just stick in like a number. All right, now it's false. Um, and of course, we could do things like take the catter. Oops. All right. 
Okay. And the catter is a procedure, and we can take that procedure, which uh, takes a number and squares it, and we can apply it to the result of multiplying three by four, and we get the squared value, 12 squared. Okay, great. There are all sorts of games you can play with procedures. You can write a procedure that returns a procedure, a procedure that takes a procedure. You know, that's what list does, um, an and map. You know, so that's a and map takes a procedure. Um, map takes a procedure. Okay, great. So those are the object, or these are the types, so the object types. Okay, so that was basic types. There are more types than that, but that's enough to get us started with the overview of the language. <clears throat> okay, expressions. 1.2. The most important elements of scheme code are expressions. Expressions can be evaluated producing a value. Okay, this is really critical terminology you under that you understand this. Um, <clears throat> A lot of times people will say things like if statement in scheme. I used to say that. <laughs> and uh, I, I always noticed that Kent Divig would, would correct a student who said if statement. Because in many languages, if is a statement. You know, in Java, if is a statement. Uh, but in scheme, if is an expression. So if null empty list okay notice we get back a value that expression produces a value and we could do something like i don't know uh, negate it okay so in a language like java you know, if is a statement and it's used for effect. It's used to con do control flow. And then, you know, whatever happens, happens. Uh, you know, you call a method on an object or, you know, some other thing happens. You update a the value of a variable, you know. But in scheme, an if is an expression. You, you can also do effects inside of the arms of an if. You can even do effects inside the test of an if if you really want. Um, but if is an expression and it returns a value. Um, and we talk about an expression being evaluated. So this whole thing is an expression, and it's, as is the if. The if is an expression. The call to null question mark is an expression. The reference to null question mark, that variable reference, is an expression. Quote empty list is an expression. This multiplication, or this procedure call, I should say. Um, three is an expression. Three evaluates the three. This variable reference uh, re uh, evaluates to a value, which is a procedure, a built-in procedure that multiplies numbers, so forth. So we have expressions that are evaluated to produce values. So here the value is minus 12, the value of that expression. It's a different way of thinking than if you're in a language like Java. Very important to, to keep in mind that in Scheme, we're often dealing with expressions. Now, there are some things like define. Okay, define x to be plus four, five. All right, well, what's, what's the value of a define? Let me stick that in the list. Notice I get an exception, invalid context for definition. So we have things like definitions, which are not expressions. Is not an expression in the same way that a use of an if is or a procedure call is. Okay, so it's not that everything in scheme is an expression we can put anywhere, but in scheme we tend to deal with expressions. And instead of having a define, I might locally scope something. So instead I could say, you know, um, let x be plus four or five, and then I do something with the x like. Uh, multiply x by itself. Okay, now that let is an expression, all right? And 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 we have sub expressions. The plus four five is an expression. Five is an expression. Four is an expression. Plus is an expression. Multiplying x by x. This entire procedure call is an expression. This variable reference is an expression. This variable reference is an expression. This is variable reference is an expression. So those are all expressions. Okay, 
So we're very much concerned with expressions, evaluation of those expressions, the value we get back, 81 in this case. Very important to have those, have those concepts in your head. <clears throat> All right, expressions. The most important elements of scheme code are expressions, okay? It's not the only elements, but the most important. Agree. Expressions can be evaluated, producing a value, actually any number of values, okay? So I think you've probably seen this already, but there's something called values. So we could do four or five, six. And notice we don't get one value back, we get three values. Compare that to say list four or five, six, where we get a single value, which is a list of three things. Here we actually get three separate values. Hmm, cool feature, very interesting feature. Most languages don't have something like that. So actually any number of values can be produced from an evaluating expression. That includes zero. Most expressions will produce one value in most scheme programs, but you could produce zero values from expression, you could produce a million values if you wanted to. The most fundamental expressions are literal expressions, okay? Literal or self-evaluating expressions. So these are expressions that just evaluate to themselves, so like hash t, which is um, a Boolean value, uh, evaluates itself, 23 values, 23, let's try it. Yep, there we go, self-evaluating or literal expressions. This notation means that the expression hash t evaluates to hash t. That is, the value for true in that the expression 23 evaluates to a number object representing the number 23. Okay. This sometimes confuses people, okay, <laughs> right? And in fact, look at the type setting. This is very important to understand the type setting here. So the expression 23, look at the typeface. It's like in typewriter font, okay? evaluates to a number object representing the number 23. That's not in typewriter font. I don't know if you can see that, but let's zoom in. These are in different fonts, okay? So there is a conceptual notion of the number 23. And then there is a scheme expression. So that is code and scheme. That 23 in typewriter font is a scheme expression whose value is some object that represents the number 23 conceptually or platonically, however you want to think of it. So notice the very careful uses of the fonts. So had, had that 23 here been in typewriter font, that actually would have been a mistake um, or vice versa had this 23 not been in typewriter font. So the, the use of, of the typography and the font choice is very, very critical. Um, now, what you'll see up here is that we have typewriter font going to typewriter font on the right, um, but this 23, this 23 is a representation of a platonic concept of the number 23, okay? So the ancient Greeks might have talked about the concept of the number 23. Now here we have some printed representation, or you know, really what that is, is a printed representation of maybe some internal representation inside of a scheme implementation of a number. Because in practice, this is probably, you know, some sort of maybe two's complement uh, you know, integer representation inside the machine. Or if you have a big num, you know, there could be a really complicated representation where, you know, it's pointing to um, memory that's been allocated on the heap, that kind of thing. So um, anyway, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's important at some level to, to keep in mind these different distinctions. All right. Now, now we have, so we're talking about literals. Now we're talking about compound expressions. Compound expressions are formed by placing a parenthesis, by placing parentheses around their sub-expressions. The first sub-expression identifies an operation. The remaining sub-expressions are operands to 
the operation. Okay, so we have plus 2, 3, 42 evaluates to 65. Is that right? 42? Yep. Okay, sure enough. All right, so here we have a compound expression, and there are three sub expressions. So it's the first sub expression, the second sub expression, the third sub expression. All three of those get evaluated in scheme, and you can, you can see what they would evaluate to independently. So, plus that variable reference evaluates to a procedure that knows how to uh, add numbers. So you can see it's a built in or you could see that it's been given a name. It's not an anonymous procedure. Compare that with like a procedure that doesn't have a name. Okay, in Shea, this is a Shea specific thing. All right. Okay, so, um, and then we have 23, of course, evaluates 23, 42 evaluates 43, 42. Um, and then once, um, the sub-expressions are evaluated, then this procedure that knows how to add numbers will be invoked with the arguments 23 and 42. Right. Okay, great. That's how it works. By the way, the order in which these things happen is unspecified in terms of whether or not the 23 gets evaluated before the 42 or if they get evaluated before the plus. It could happen left to right order, right to left order, some unspecified order. In Racket, they specify left to right order, but in Scheme, uh, I believe it's still unspecified. Certainly in R5, it was unspecified. I believe it's still unspecified. All right, here's another one. Plus uh, 14 times 2342. Let me see if I can just copy that. Sometimes copying from a PDF works less well. Ah, it seemed to work fine. Okay, so here, um, we have three sub-expressions for the outer application. Once again, our friend plus 14. You know, so that's a variable reference, the plus. And then we, we have another compound expression, okay, uh, which has three sub-expressions, variable reference, and then two literals. Okay, great. In the first of these examples, plus is the name of the built-in operation for addition, and 23 and 42 are the operands. The expression plus 23, 42 reads as the sum of 23 and 42. Notice the font change when it's talking about the sum. Okay, so now we're talking about the platonic entity, the, the, num the number 23 and the number 42. Okay, we're not talking about a scheme expression or an internal representation of a number in a scheme implementation. We're talking about, you know, sort of like abstract math here. Compound expressions can be nested. The second example reads as the sum of 14 and the product of 23 and 42. Yeah, that's right. As these examples indicate, Compound expressions in Scheme are always written using the same prefix notation as a consequence. Okay, prefix notation means that <clears throat> the first thing after a left parenthesis is the operator. Okay, and that's prefix notation. Postfix would be if the operator came at the end, like old Hewlett Packard calculators using what are called RPN, reverse Polish notation. Polish notation was used by Polish logicians. And so that was like a prefix notation. So this is like Polish notation, if I understand correctly. So there's a long history of distinguished Polish logicians. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, so we have prefix notation in Scheme. And, uh, you know, this is an area where people complain about the funny syntax. And they say, well, why can't it just be, you know, like a normal language where you write something like that, right? And why, why don't you have a semicolon and treat it as something other than a comment? Well, you know, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> you know, you can write that in Shea, but <laughs> notice what happens. Um, <clears throat> but there are advantages, there are real advantages with the notation used in Scheme. And so one advantage is you could take any number of arguments. Okay, that all works. 
can take one argument. That works. Can take zero arguments. That works. Wow, okay, that's a very general operation. You could even take a list of numbers. Okay, we have a list of them, and then you can do this apply trick where we can apply plus um, to the list. Oh, that's pretty cool. And the fact that plus is, you know, just a variable um, that is bound to the procedure means that I can do things like say, you know, define my list of numbers uh, to be this thing. And then I can define my ops, or list of operators, list of ops, I don't know, list of loo, <laughs> whatever. Uh, that could be, well here I have to be careful, I don't want to quote it. I want to have a plus and a times, let's say. Okay, so now I can map over uh, my list of operators and I could say, well, let's create an anonymous function that takes an operator and applies op to lon, but of course we need to actually apply it. So we'll do an apply. Okay, so I can do things like that. Well, my lon's a little boring because it has a zero. Let me get rid of that zero. Okay, that's more interesting. Okay, so, so those are the sorts of flexible games we can play. The, the other thing that's really nice is that in traditional programming languages, you have to worry about things like precedence of operators, you know, and does, does times, you know, um, happen before, you know, does multiplication happen before addition, and what about bit shift left and whatever it is, okay? And if you look at C or Java, they have these long tables showing operator precedence and you have to worry about all these sorts of things, associativity, precedence. Uh, in Scheme, you don't have to because it's all explicit, right? Like the places where you could put parentheses in other languages to, to make that uh, clear, you just always do that in Scheme. So there's no misunderstanding of that. and. Uh, I actually strongly prefer it this way. It took a little adjustment, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to go back. And and if you look at how people do parsing and you know abstract syntax trees and things like that, basically you're dealing with the abstract syntax tree. The other thing is it makes it very easy to do program manipulation and macros and um, that sort of thing. So it's uh, I like it. I like it. I think it's actually a strength. Okay. Um, nope. <clears throat> Saved by the bell. Let me just read this last sentence. Uh, As these examples indicate, compound expressions in scheme are always written using the same prefix notation. Oh yeah, that's what we're saying. As a consequence, the parentheses are needed to indicate structure. Consequently, superfluous parentheses, which are often permissible in mathematical notation and also in many programming languages, are not allowed in Scheme. Okay, so my friend Aziz taught me this. In Scheme, parens always mean something. You can't add parens or remove them without changing something. Like if I were, you know, in some other programming language, maybe I just add a set of parens around a number if I feel like it. Well, that means procedure application. So now I'm tr I'm treating this expression, 23, as if its value will be a procedure of zero arguments that I will then call. So that's gonna give me an error. Okay, I can't just do that. And uh, this is sort of a beginning mistake you often see is that you know people write extra parens. I was like, well, that doesn't mean what you think it does because this inner expression Evaluates the 980, and now you're doing a procedure application because that's what parens mean, unless there's a keyword right after the open paren. So, um, you know, the, there's one way to write it. There's one way to write it in terms of the paren structure. So I actually like that. All right. As in many uh, other languages, white space, including line endings, is not significant when it separates sub expressions of an expression and can be used to indicate structure. All right, so um, 
I can write this. I can write that. Okay, I can write that. Doesn't matter. Okay, doesn't matter to the computer. It matters to a person. Now, what I can't do is remove all the white space between 23 and 42 because now I just changed what that number is. Okay, let's see. Can I do that? Nope, because in Scheme, you can do things like define to be, okay. In Scheme, we're allowed to have variable names that might not be allowed in other languages. So you gotta be, gotta be a little careful there. All right, well, I have to do a call now, um, but we are up to 1.3, so we got done about half a page in uh, 50 minutes. Pretty good progress. Not bad. Okay, only <clears throat> 100 more hours before we get through the first part of the spec. Talk to you all later. Bye-bye.